Hello from Eindhoven and thank you for receiving me, although it's virtually, in Tokyo. Today I'm going to talk about the urgent need for better artificial kidney technologies. My name is Volker Wieringa, I'm from IMAC, which is located in Eindhoven in the Netherlands. The problem with kidney disease is that it's a kind of a silent killer. It sneaks up on you with some vague symptoms, which usually are diagnosed quite late, when you're already in an advanced state of kidney disease. And when your kidneys fail, that is, if their function goes below 15%, you will need a kidney replacement therapy, or you will die. Let's start with the present treatment options that we have. Transplantation from one human to another is the best option that we have at the moment, but People that are so lucky to get a transplant kidney have to swallow immune suppression drugs for the rest of their lives. Otherwise, the transplant will be rejected. And you don't want that, of course. Uh, that has a disadvantage. You are more vulnerable to, for instance, getting cancer. But also, you're much more vulnerable to infections. And the COVID pandemic that we have just recently seen, and which is even still ongoing, has demonstrated that this is a big problem. In fact, many people that are swallowing immune suppression drugs for their donor organ are not or hardly responding to vaccination. So that is one of the disadvantages. But one of the advantages is that you don't need dialysate. So you're not stuck to a machine, which of course is great. Unfortunately, anyhow, there's a shortage of donor organs, a big shortage, and it's structural. For the last decades, we've seen it. So not everybody can be helped with a donor organ. And the others then either have to dialysate with hemodialysis, where the blood is taken from your body to a machine, cleaned and returned, which involves needling. There is another option that is called peritoneal dialysis, where the blood is not taken from your body, but you use the dialysis filter which is naturally in your own body, namely the peritoneum, and then you pump the cleaning fluid into your belly, and after a while it is removed. Unfortunately, your peritoneum, uh, it ages quickly with these procedures. And it ages even more quickly when you get infections in your belly and a lot of patients get infections because every time you have to have that opening of the connection and closing it. Which means that peritoneal dialysis on average only goes for a year, a few years maximum, and then you have to switch to hemodialysis if there's still no transplant. What makes it a big honor to speak for a Japanese audience is that Japan does something very, very good with dialysis. Um, you keep your patients alive longer than in the rest of the world. Japan and Taiwan are the best countries on that. And the rest of the world so can learn a lot from Japan. But this also means, if you keep your patients longer alive, that you have a high percentage of dialysis patients because they go on longer. And you see that in the graph which we see here, uh, it's rising. These are the years from 1968 to 2020, and you see a continuous rise there. This is partly due because of the lifestyle of patients changing, and high blood pressure, diabetes, and cardiovascular problems can increase your uh, chance to get uh, kidney failure. But also, by keeping your patients longer alive, which is a good job that you do in Japan, you get more patients, that's clear. Now, what is the financial burden to society? Well, it's big. According to the Japanese Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare, the annual medical costs of dialysis in Japan is about 1.6 trillion yen, which is 10 billion euros. That's a lot of money. It's about 4% of Japan's total medical costs per year. So it's quite substantial. And I'm here today to tell you that by investing 1 billion euros, it could be possible 
if all countries that have the best brains working on this in the world would join their forces, that by 2030 we could have an implantable artificial kidney, which would be great because it would lower the costs of treatment by, say, 60 to 80 percent, and it would free the patient from being hooked up to a machine a considerable amount of their time and leading a miserable life in which they cannot move about too much. But how? How are we going to get there? Well, there is a roadmap to freedom, which is made by many nephrologists, technologists, inventors and entrepreneurs worldwide in the Kidney Health Initiative Roadmap for Innovation. Which brings us from the present situation, stuck in a chair or a bed with a machine connected, to already 2024, an ability to pick up your dialysis machine and travel easily. A hemodialysis machine in a suitcase. It will be done in 2024. But we're not finished then. I told you, we want to go on. By 2030, we could have a 24-7 working artificial implanted kidney if we join forces worldwide. And we need Japan on that because I know you have excellent experts on this. All these improvements will jointly lead to a better quality of life, a much more eco-friendly treatment with less garbage coming from the treatment and much more cost effectiveness. And that is what we need because if we go on like this, dialysis be simply becomes unsustainable in costs. Hemodialysis started in the Netherlands. In 1945, Dr. Kolf used his home-built machine in the hospital that he worked for the first time successfully on an acute kidney failure patient that awoke from uremic coma and lived many years afterwards after her kidneys had recovered enough to keep the body alive. That was a milestone. It hadn't never been done before. And his doctoral thesis, you can see here, unfortunately, is in Dutch. But it was a world revolution. By 1972, a lot of things had happened. The machines had become a little bit better and they had been spread around the world. And at that moment, 90% of the dialysis patients that were treated in the United States of America, they treated themselves at home. And the expectation was at that moment, you know, in 10 years dialysis is going to be portable and it's all going to be wonderful. Eh? The doctors made big steps. Unfortunately, the business model of dialysis changed from home to in-center dialysis when that was reimbursed easily by the American government. And it was much more profitable to bring the patients to a center and have several patients working with one machine across a day than having one machine per patient at home all the time. And that was a pity, because 50 years later we see there's not much progress fundamentally made. This patient is still tied to the wall. Yes, his vacuum cleaner has become a robot and he has a flat screen TV. And even his toilet is so smart that it can order new toilet paper which is delivered by a drone automatically. But his machine keeps him still stuck to the wall. So how are we going to change that? Well, the Kidney Health Initiative applies the power of road mapping in the renal scene to improve the technology for kidney replacement therapies. The link in the PDF that you will get at the end will bring you to this road map. You can read it yourself. One of the things that I do to get along on that roadmap to improve things for patients is the BITREM project. Last year we won the Kidney X Prize with that. And what is it? Well, the MITREM is a small electronic chip that holds electronics for protein-bound uremic toxins removal and a complete medical monitor with different parameters like ECG, hematocrit, SpO2, bioimpedance spectroscopy and temperature. That chip has also a processor and memory on board, plus wireless charging and communication. And it all fits on this tiny chip, so small I can put it on my finger. How does that work? 
Well, there's an unmet need in hemodialysis at the moment. A hemodialysis machine uses a filter. That filter has tiny holes. Through those holes, it can filter out the toxin, the toxic poison, poisonous substances in the blood. The small ones get easily through. The bigger ones, of course, get a little bit less easy through, but they still fit. But there's also the protein-bound toxins, by themselves small enough to go through the filter. But they are bound 95% of the time to albumin, a very useful protein in their blood. You don't want to lose the albumin. That is not good. But yeah, if the, the protein-bound toxins are stuck to the albumin, how do we get rid of it? Well, only the small free fraction in the blood can pass the filter, but that's only 5%. So we have a problem. Fortunately, Professor Jankowski from Aachen in Germany discovered that these electrostatic bindings can be shaken by radio waves and in that way loosen up the protein-bound toxins. Hmm. But the principle was known and shown. So at iMac we said, wait a minute, why don't we take all that electronic functionality and squeeze it on a tiny chip? Then it's much more portable and energy efficient and also less disturbing to the surroundings. And so we did. This is the proof, by the way, that Professor Jankowski shows that the effect really works. We see that with the electromagnetic field switched on, the concentrations, they, they get lower of the poisonous stuff. And that is good. The MITRAM project has as a target to make a kind of a memory stick sized device that with simple clip-on to the blood line and the dialysate line to make the electromagnetic waves couple into the fluid and meet each other at the filter where they need to be strongest. So that will be an add-on device with any existing hemodialysis machine in the world. But we're not going to stop there. We do this together with the UMC Utrecht, the famous hospital across the world if we look upon dialysis. They help us, and also of course Aachen, where Professor Jankowski comes from, to work on this system. It's still work in progress, but we're working at the moment to find the resonance peaks of the AM waves to couple into the filter. And hopefully we'll get it running in a few years. Now, that was for the status of today, but you also want to have some prediction about the future. Now, the best way to predict the future is to ship it yourself, as a guy from Apple once said. So, together with the American Association of Kidney Patients, the European Association of Kidney Patients has called out the decade of the kidney. At this moment, we see machines, uh, hemodialysis machines, getting simpler and smaller and also more made for home use. These are on the market, the NANX stage machine, the Quanta machine, the Physidia machine and the Tableau. Wonderful machines, finally made for use at home. The only problem is they are so-called single-pass machines. And single-pass machines, they have uh, a disadvantage. You need very pure water to do the dialysis treatments. And one hemodialysis treatment uses this amount of water, this pallet full of water, where only one-third of that water will actually see the patient and go through the filter and two-thirds of that water is not even seeing the patient, it's being thrown away just to make the water pure enough. That's one dialysis treatment. You can imagine if you go three times a week for a treatment you will have a, 156 pellets per year per patient. That's a huge amount of water. So how can we reduce that huge amount of water per treatment? Well, we can. The next kidney machine that will come on the market in 2024 uses so-called sorbent technology to regenerate the dialysate. It will be reused and reused and purified in between so that you only need six liters of water per treatment, which makes the machine much more portable. And that is very handy and, for instance, for Japan, Professor Nangaku, the president-elect for the next ISN kidney pres presidency, he formulated already that Japan would be beneficial if they would have a small 
machine that is much less dependent of infrastructure because a tsunami or an earthquake can destroy the infrastructure in a region and including the hemodialysis center. So that would be a, an interesting aspect for the Japan situation. And this is how the machine looks like in practice. It's not yet on the market, it's going to be CE marked in 2024, but I can already tell you that it fits in a suitcase that is still allowed as hand luggage carry-on in the airplane. Which is of course a big advantage, because if I want to go on holiday or for traveling, then I'd like to know that my machine is in the overhead bin above me and that it's not in the belly of the plane, because you never know. I might arrive in Tokyo and my machine might arrive in Toronto. It wouldn't be the first time that things happen like that. So that would be a comfort for the patients. The machine does a lot of things. It can be made suitable for frequent short daily therapy, but also for nocturnal, that means during the night. It's using about six liters of dialysate, which I already told. It's double isolated, which means it's extremely safe. Its safety is full cardiac floating. It means it does not depend on any earth connection. You can use a simple two-prong plug to plug it in anywhere. It will fit in Japan, it will fit in the US. No electrician or plumbers are needed to modify your home, which is the case with the normal machines now. And telecommunication and monitoring is wirelessly built in with the weight scale and the blood pressure meter. The efficiency is comparable with a normal existing hemodialysis machine, but it's much smaller. And it fits, like I said, in this carry-on trolley. The sorbent is the secret. That does the job. Now the European Union also thinks it is very important that we innovate for kidney therapies. That is why they held on June 15 this year a large forum in Brussels in the European Parliament to talk with patients, with doctors, nurses, with uh, inventors, innovators like me and many others, and also with people from the government and financial people, all together on the table to see how we can improve these developments and how we can walk along that roadmap. During this meeting I was explaining that we can go towards a modular implantable artificial kidney if we cleverly exploit chip technology. With chip technology we can make filters extremely small and extremely efficient. And by 2030 we might use chip technology to have an artificial implantable kidney ready, which would have a silicon filter which would have electronics to shake loose the pee buds, but also monitor how the artificial kidney is doing on the inside with all kinds of sensors. And these sensors would communicate with a device outside and tell the doctor remotely how it's going. And this is not science fiction. It's science that can become true if we all work together. If we bundle the best brains worldwide, we can build better treatments. We work together with the patients, the doctors, the nurses, the policy makers, and of course the inventors and the investors. We can work with the engineers. Well, you've got plenty of engineers in Japan and good ones. And of course, entrepreneurs that make business models out of this. Together we can work in the decade of the kidney and we can work together with the European Kidney Patient Federation and the European Kidney Health Alliance. The Americans are on board with the AAKP. But hey, Japan has its own foundations and patient associations. We will be happy to join with you. And of course, we need a solid funding program to realize all this. And the good news is that's an amazing scientific discovery. It does not only work with euros, it even works with yens and dollars and all kinds of stuff. Rubles might be a problem, but we'll see. This was what I wanted to tell you about this roadmap to freedom that already is written by many experts together and is being executed by many, many research institutes. IMEC is just one of them. And we work together happily with others. The Japanese Society for Artificial Organs, for instance, is very active and we know they do excellent work. In fact, the headquarters of all artificial organ societies in the world, the International Federation for Artificial Organs, is located in Japan as well. 
So I know you have excellent talents and we are looking forward to see whether we can work together. So with that, I end my talk and I'm just asking, are there any questions from the audience?